Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Perez Art Museum, Miami. My name is Marie Vickles. I'm the Director of Education, and thank you for joining us for our Local Views at PAM program with artist Rosemarie Cromwell. Our Virtual Local Views program is presented with the generous support of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation and features Miami-based artists sharing their practice and discussing works of art from PAM's exhibition programs that connect in various ways to their own work. As a 21st century museum dedicated to representing the people and communities of South Florida, the Perez Art Museum Miami strives to be a leader in the presentation, study, interpretation, and care of international modern and contemporary art while representing and cherishing the unique diversity of Miami-Dade. Through our exhibitions and programs, we aim to encourage everyone to see art as an incentive for genuine human interaction. Tonight, I am so happy to present Rosemarie Cromwell, a Miami-based photographer making work that poetically captures the small and big moments of our lives. Before I introduce Rosemarie, I would like to acknowledge and thank the incredible team of people that worked so very hard to make these programs come together online. Big thank yous to Anita Bram, Associate Director of Adult Programs and Audience Engagement, and our world-class AV team, Denise Faxis and Andrew Bird. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Rosemarie Cromwell is a photographer whose work explores the effects of globalization on our intimate lives and the tenuous space between political and the spiritual. Rosemarie has had solo exhibitions at the Diablo Rosso Gallery and the Antithesis Gallery, both in Panama City, Panama. Her work has been exhibited at Aperture Foundation in New York, Prism Art Fair in Miami, the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center, and the Silver Eye Art Center in Pittsburgh, among many others. Rosemarie is a recipient of a Fulbright, Fulbright grant, a Getty Reportage grant, Ulight Creator Award, and was a light work artist in resident. Her first book, El Libro Se Primo de la Suerte, was published in 2018 by TIS Books and was awarded the Light Work, work Photo Book Prize and named one of the 25 best photo books of 2018 by Time Magazine. She has just published her second book with TIS, Eclipse, which describes the process of matrescence during the pandemic. As you watch along this evening on Facebook or YouTube Live, please post questions for Rosemarie in the comments section. She will try to answer as many as possible in the Q&A portion of this evening's presentation. And remember, if you value this and other programs presented by the museum, please consider supporting us by going to pam.org backslash donate. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Rosemarie Cromwell. Thank you so much, Marie, for that uh, introduction. And hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening uh, with me. And thank you to the Perez for having me as well. I'm truly honored to have this platform to share my work with you. I am uh, speaking to you all from my studio at the Bakehouse Art Complex. Um, I'll give you a little look around the studio. Uh, Bakehouse Art Complex is located in Wynwood, Miami. Miami is situated on the traditional homeland of Native nations, including the Tiquesta, the Calusa, the Taino, and today the Miccosukee and the Seminole. I'd like to pay my respect to these tribes and recognize their continued existence and our continued occupation of, our, of their land. I use photography in multiple ways to tell stories through books, exhibitions and journalistic pieces, I try to find the best venue for the stories I'm compelled to share. And today I'm going to share with you four different projects. Um, 
a little bit about my history. I'm from Seattle. I grew up there, um, which is a port city on the West Coast, Seattle, Washington. And, and when I was in high school, I witnessed the World Trade Organization protests in the streets of Seattle in 1999. These protests had a major impact on my uh, what be would become my future artistic and journalistic interests and uh, led me to question the impact that neoliberal uh, globalization had on not only Seattle, but many locations throughout the world. In addition, well, after I left Seattle, I attended Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, and uh, I had a professor there, a uh, photojournalist, Harry Madison, who had photographed um, the Nicaraguan and El Salvadorian civil wars um, in Latin America. And taking his classes made, uh, made me realize that there was a huge and important long history of U.S. involvement in Latin America, U.S. military involvement but that, that I was not aware about. And these two uh, turning points in my life led me to apply to a Fulbright, to, uh, a Fulbright grant to investigate um, the, the effect of the Panama Canal uh, on local Panamanians. Um, and now, uh, Andrew, would you mind please showing the first slide? Um, so, thank you. <laughs> when I, um, in Panama, a woman that I serendipit serendipitously met uh, brought me to a community of 500 people living in old US military barracks alongside the Panama Canal called Coco Solo. Um, in Coco Solo, I met her friend, a pastor Michael Brown, who originally was born in Jamaica, but had spent much of his life growing up in Coco Solo. And here is a very early picture I took of him in 2007, probably. I wanted to uh, show you show you all a map of Panama just to situate exactly where Coco Solo was. Um, you can see here is Panama City on the Pacific side of Panama, and then crossing the canal, um, crossing Panama, uh, and the route of the canal is Cologne City on the other end. And just east of Cologne is uh, was the um, Coco Solo military base. Um, in the early 1980s, uh, Pan the Panamanian government reached an agreement with the U.S. government to uh, start a transition of handing over um, U.S. military bases and actually the whole canal zone, which was um, 10 miles on either side of the U.S. occupied canal in Panama back to Panama. The U.S. military had occupied this area in Panama for what was going to be 100 years after they um, uh, orchestrated the building of the canal. One of the first areas to be handed over to the Panamanian government was the Coco Solo military base. And you can see in this aerial photograph um, that um, when I, that here is Coco Solo, the Coco Solo base, and on either side of Coco Solo, this is what it looked like when I first went there, were um, port terminals. And also back here is the biggest free trade zone in Latin America. And further beyond that is the entrance to the Caribbean side of the Panama Canal. I was very uh, struck, by, uh, struck by Coco Solo because it was a community um, that had been moved into these barracks by the Panamanian government who decided to use the barracks as public housing, moving people in from nearby Cologne that had experienced multiple fires um, and, use, and using the buildings as pseudo public housing, but had failed to keep up the infrastructure of the buildings over 30 years. And this community did not have running water, but sat alongside one of the most important waterways of world trade in the world. And this, this contradiction uh, was glaring and very impactful on me as, a, as somebody in their early 20s um, traveling for, for one of the first times. 
I was really inspired by Pastor, Pastor Michael Brown, otherwise known as Mikey, uh, at his community work that he was doing in Coco Solo. He was running a soup kitchen um, in the area with very little resources and also had adopted six boys. Um, I wanted to help him in whatever way I could. And one of those, one of the resource I had was artist friends that lived in Panama City and in Cologne. So together with um, our uh, Panamanian artist, Lorna and Dara and, and Mikey, we founded um, what, what initially started as a small initiative called Cambio Creativo or Creative Change. Um, our vision was that through uh, skill sharing, we would help to empower Coco Solo youth to, um, to share their own lives and then promote self-determination. Our small program grew into a, a legal nonprofit. And over the years, uh, we received grants from the US Embassy as well um, as uh, from other um, international organizations. And we created an after school program that ran for five days a week. And uh, our center was located also in the barracks here as a percussion class. So in Coco Solo, while I was um, while I was helping to, to run Cambio Creativo, I also um, was photographing, but I did, I struggled to, to, um, to figure out how I should or wanted to photograph in Coco Solo. Many Coco Solo residents were upset with media portrayals of their community. Um, the local media would talk about the poverty and the lack of in infrastructure and the violence, but would never talk about the, the strong sense of community and the joy that the community had. And I did not want to repeat these mistakes. Um, I wanted to create something that was very you know, personal to my experience there. And I was spending, um, you know, I would stay with Mikey and his family for uh, a week or two at a time in Coco Solo and spend time with his boys and also lead workshops. And I started to, the photo workshops and my own photography started to blend almost together. When I was encouraging the youth to be more performative, I was finding that I also was incorporating that into my own photography and photographing our fun, uh, our fun hangs um, to go fishing or playing in nature. And I was photographing this very tenuous time of adolescence. Um, this is uh, Vladimir, one of his sons, also known as Pocho. Um, and sometimes when I would uh, photograph him, he would appear uh, to still be a young boy. And other times it, his, uh, he would look more like a young man. And um, I found that this variance in how he was appearing in photos was also uh, reflective in the same way of how I was photographing Coco Solo, uh, the landscape and the environment, that sometimes it would feel like an oppressive dystopia, and at other times it would feel like a lush natural paradise. So as I became older and more cognizant as my role as a of a of a foreigner of, of a u.s citizen coming into the space and my country's role as a as a my country's role as a colonizer of, of panama and in addition to my role as a global consumer i realized that all of us are, are implicated in, in that i myself and my country were implicated in impacting the the lives of individuals like Pocho who live, who live alongside one of the biggest routes of global trade and in land that was occupied by the US military for so many years. And um, I began to, to realize I really needed to tell this story alongside um, the story of adolescence within Coco Solo. So I have recently been exploring um, archives of Coco Solo. Here is a, a an archive image of the Coco Solo barracks. And um, in Coco Solo, you know, uh, it's, it's well known that John McCain uh, was born there. It was also um, a military base uh, for um, 
was a submarine base during World War II and served as a, as a command base during the US, U.S. invasion of Panama. Um, so it has a long and uh, complicated history. And my intention, this is a, progress, a project in progress, and it's probably my longest project um, as of yet, is to tie these multiple narratives together to, to explore how historical uh, stories of a place can impact the present day. I've also photographed uh, other uh, military bases um, in Panama and uh, exploring perhaps other ways to bring this narrative into to this project, which is titled King of Fish. And while I was photographing in these um, military bases, I, I came upon some wartime reenactors in the space and also have photographed them. Um, but this, this project really kind of set the, set the stage for my other projects and showed me that long-term investment in a place and with a community um, really was the only way that I saw uh, that I saw uh, as a um, responsible way to tell a story about a place that I was not from. Um, and uh, you know, working with Cambio Creativo was very uh, was not just a nonprofit project, but uh, a project that really taught me and gave me so much. The second project I'm going to share with you is um, is a book that, uh, as Marie mentioned, I published in 2019 um, called El Libro Supremo de la Suerte, The Supreme Book of Luck. And at the same time I was working and living in Panama, I was also spending a lot of time pseudo living and visiting in, in Havana. And um, this book contains a facsimile of a small number book um, that has a Cuban Chinese number system called La Chirada, where every number from one to 100 has a specific meaning. Um, two is butterfly, 52 is bicycle, 57 is bed, and so on. Some are very specific to Cuba, there's revolution, and some are you know, more universal. So here is a copy of this book published by Tiz Books and uh, Lightwork. Um, and this is a uh, image of the special edition of the book, which um, on the front of the, of the cover, it, there's an image, a, pr uh, a print made by myself and a Cuban printmaker, Ramon Vargas. I first went to Cuba in 2005 on a photography study abroad trip uh, through NYU. And I was really lucky to, to take lectures and to study with Cuban photographers uh, that photographed the revolution, Raul Corrales and uh, Jose Figueroa. And I, I really you know, fell in love with, with the country and the people I met there and kept going back uh, year after year, uh, really spending a lot of time getting to know um, the city um, and making strong, strong friendships there. But I also, as I was doing in Panama too, I became um, more aware of the importance of acknowledging subjectivity in photography. And, you know, being a, a foreigner depicting a place that's so overly photographed and exoticized, uh, as um, Cuba is, I wanted to avoid regurgitating these visual stereotypes. You know, I was deciding kind of the, what kind of photographer I wanted to be. I knew I, I knew I wanted to use images, but um, I didn't want to fall into that into that line. So, I really began photographing intimate moments of my day to day life in Cuba. What informed my personal experience of place? The place has always interested me um, as a as a subject. This image is of a, a poster in my that was in my friend Milagros uh, house for many, many years. Uh, it, to me, it really embodied this idea of tropicality in the Caribbean that we see in images. Um, and it was a such a well loved poster that she had taped it up and, and preserved it for many years. 
Here is my, my friend uh, Milagro, who I met in 2005 on the street. On the street, when I asked her if I could take a picture outside her house, um, and we became good friends. Um, and over the years, I stayed with her and made most of these images while staying with her. And uh, she really guided my um, my sense of a place. She is the one that introduced me to La Bolita, the underground lottery in Cuba. This is uh, one of her number calculation books that she used to play the lottery. She also used La Chorada to choose her number some days. So for example, if a butterfly flew into her kitchen, she might play two that day. Um, and uh, this is also her turtle, which I believe was a number she played on certain days too. Um, and I was really struck by the gesture of looking at the everyday and making something more monumental by through the act of playing it in the lottery. And I found a, a parallel to that act to how I was photographing, which was photo photographing everyday things. Um, but by through the act of photographing, they became more mon monumental. The photographs became a homage to that thing. Um, this is a stick that I photographed while walking down the street with, um, with Milagro one day. And I paused to take the photograph. Um, she turned to the neighbor and said, oh, don't mind her. She photographs th weird things like that all the time. And he said, no, that's my stick. I, I put it out on sunny days because people like to look at it. Um, this is a, uh, a image of the books of a book spread. Um, it, uh, I wanted to create a, uh, nonlinear narrative and the small book, um, sorry, the small pages, uh, in the book helped to do that by creating different relationships between the images. I also created pseudo chapters using numbers from La Chirada. I photographed in, in, a, in a diversity of ways by walking, coming upon things on the street, um, reenacting scenes that perhaps I thought of while not in Cuba, writing them down in a notebook and coming back and, and uh, working with my friends and friends of Milagros, a lot of whom were performers, were dancers, um, to reenact these images. Here's an image that I titled New York which uh, speaks to this idea of a place. And I feel that both New York and Havana live in the imagination of so many due to the political, the tense political relationship between the two countries. Here is a exhibition image of, of this work in an art space in Panama City. This exhibition was curated by um, Panamanian curator Paula Cooper. And uh, together we went and found um, objects that related to um, objects that I photographed in the images. So this door was very similar to a door I photographed that's in the beginning of the book, and it becomes a stand-in uh, for the image in the exhibition. Um, so this, uh, this varied approach to making images continued into my next project, um, which I will uh, publish as a book next month with Pomegranate Press. Uh, the book is going to be titled A More Fluid Atmosphere, which is a quote from um, uh, Joan Didion from her book, Miami. I moved to Miami four years ago and began this work. Miami being a port city, you know, a center of globalization really fell in line with the past places I've lived and worked. I was drawn to areas of Miami that seemed more focused on serving global commerce than the locals that live in those spaces. Um, these are spaces with warehouses, um, housing goods, with industry, and with less focus on local lives. Well, that's what I was perceiving. I wanted to investigate through this work how uh, living in a globalized, disparate world affects our inner lives. A lot of times in Miami, I feel like it's, there are things and situations and places that point to other places um, and refer to other places versus being in the present or being in the now. And that was an interesting, um, interesting concept that I hadn't really experienced before. 
I've been drawn to photograph labor, commerce, tropical decay and life, and changing neighborhoods, spirituality, as well as transcendental moments and within spaces and objects that perhaps aren't seen as intimate, but that make up our everyday. Here's an exhibition shot of this work a couple years ago at the Rafa pop-up in, in the design district in Miami. And just uh, for, for fun, I just wanted to show you guys part of my, show you all part of my process. This is a, a book dummy of the upcoming book. And so um, I just taped together you know, uh, laser printed paper and I'm working on the edit at the moment. So the very last project I'm gonna share with you is a um, new book with Tiz again um, called Eclipse. And this time my own body and my own new baby became the subjects. I gave birth to my daughter Samoa in late 2019. And going through the experience of birth really made me exa examine the thin line between life and death, not only due to my long labor, but also to the global pandemic that started two months after she was born. I started taking photos with my phone uh, during my postpartum or the fourth trimester, as some call it, you know, um, the first three months of Simone's life, just to really document that that time so I would remember later what it was like. The pandemic hit when, like I said before, Simone was two months old and the eclipse that I felt was the postpartum period became more pronounced due to the pandemic. My, my inner and my outer world became even more separate. As time went on, um, I began photographing with um, a larger film camera and also with the help of my husband, Roman Yavich, and my photographer friend, Jesse Schilling. I, um, I concentrated on the labor and acts of devotion that early motherhood requires. At the time, my identity was also shifting, being somebody who was, has been, had been so focused on my work for so many years um, that now my, con my labor was was motherhood and not photography, but photographing this process really helped to reconcile both of them. The, and the background and landscape of Miami also played a character in this book. And I thought a lot about what does it mean to bring a life into the world with, uh, within the background of a, of a pandemic and even more of climate change and some would say the end times of capitalism. And um, and yes, that is my um, that is my presentation for you all. Thank you so much for for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or hear your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rose. Mm -hmm. um, that was amazing, and um, I'll let everybody who's out there in the audience get warmed up um, and ask you some questions in the meantime. Um, Okay, first question. Do you have a particular theme in mind while out making photographs or does the theme come to you once you start looking back at the work and once it's been photographed or is it a bit of both? It's definitely a bit of both. I definitely, you know, I have interests that have kind of driven the course of, of my artistic career, even, you know, for that emerged when I was a teenager, but I, I don't really work with a plan uh, in the beginning. You know, a lot of times I have to work intuitively because I'm also just getting to know a subject or a place. Um, and that takes time. You know, time has become a really important medium for me. And um, I've learned patience too. So uh, yeah, definitely through editing is when I kind of go back and, and learn about, well, okay, what am I interested in to, and what, I want, what do I want to articulate further? Right. Thank you. That makes sense. And I guess it relates to that question as well. But something I always wonder about photographers, just because I admire them and their work so much, is do you carry your camera on you always? Or do you like leave for the day with the goal of taking photos and like doing work? Like, I guess you don't approach it like a normal work day. Yeah. Properly, but like, do you always have a camera on you? Um, well, now I do because I 
consider my phone to be a valid camera. Right. Um, and, and, you know, for my, for this last project eclipse, you know, it's, I'm mixing mediums. Um, but no, I don't, um, sometimes I do need to take some time off, especially because I also, I work as an editorial and journal, uh, journalistic photographer. So I'm photographing a lot. So there, there are times that, but lately I have been carrying it more because starting to photograph, you know, uh, my daughter. And so, yeah. Right. Right. You have a, the perfect subject now. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. Um, I have another question. Have social media platforms like Instagram, which are image intensive, informed your photography practice in any way? Um, I guess it's encouraged me to photograph more with the phone, especially in the beginning when I uh, was posting more phone images and I still do. It gives you, um, it gives you an immediate audience, a platform, um, and, uh, so I guess I've embraced that medium in that sense. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, we have some, some comments coming in from all of the fans, uh, Lauren Reagan, Andrea Rosen, Maritza Sanchez Schubert. Um, and then we have a question from Yael Malka. What do you think a photo book does that is harder to achieve with an exhibition of photography? Mm. Well, there was something very intimate about the the act of looking at a photo book. You know, it's sitting in your lap, um, and uh, you you have less choices, I guess, in a sense too. Um, you you you're usually flipping pages, which does provide a lot of constraints. Uh, but I think I'm drawn to the photo book for that experience, that immersive experience that it. Um, that it gives you know but that was one of the things i was trying to play around with in my book by putting in some small pages was just like how do i change this a little bit or create something a little bit more dynamic right yeah thank you um let's see we have a question from uh leanne milton and fabio um when do you feel that the project is ready to become a book oh yeah uh that is um you know i when i was making um a libro i thought it was ready a number of times and i what what i have done in the past is just um trying to edit it together make a make an edit of the book and then i'll see if there's any holes and uh i guess i um you know i realized i had to i had to keep shooting there were some things i was missing to build the narrative i wanted but i think when i was starting to photograph the same things over and over again is when i realized okay maybe this is maybe this is done <laughs> Right, right. That makes sense. It's like a whole cohesive project at that point. Um, let's see. We have a question from Yadra Peralta. Um, how has the phone changed your camera work? Well, it definitely has made it easier to to, to be more spontaneous with photography. Uh, it's, I think it's made me looser. You know, it, it, it's made me less, um, you know, for me, the medium doesn't really matter. It's really like the message in a sense so uh, i think it's opened up it's yeah it's opened up something in me that wasn't there before absolutely thank you um and then we have a question from andrea rosen uh can you comment on your connection as a journalist and a photographer sure yeah um i i think that journalistic platforms are amazing platforms to talk about issues that i care about because it's mass media in a sense um and uh for instance i i really like to report from places where i have spent a lot of time so i'm not frequently you know traveling to you know india per se a country i've never been to to report on something but i did a I did a long-term project for Harper's that was about the uh, relocation of the city of Cologne that was being basically, that was undergoing a mass gentrification by the Panamanian government by moving out all, the, all of its citizens to uh, rebuild the city and uh, for not the citizens, for perhaps foreigners. And it was, I couldn't, I didn't understand why it wasn't being talked about in Panamanian press or even in, in the United States. So it's a story that I pitched uh, to Harper's and, um, and I feel like it's just, you know, it's a, there's different mediums or formats depending on what kind of story you want to tell. And so I, um, I, I just photograph it in a different way when I'm a journalist. I can't take so much, um, I, uh, 
you know, like it can't be as subjective in the sense like all of it is subjective, but nobody's performing because there is some ethics <laughs> that you have to think about. So I do go into a different mode, but usually I am thinking about similar topics. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I, I usually like to close with like, um, what are you working on next or what project in the future are you looking forward to if you have that sorted out? Sure. Well, I'm, um, I'm working on trying to finish the, the King of Fish project in Panama. So right now working, I'm looking at archival work and perhaps needing to go back to Panama, perhaps to shoot more. I'm not sure yet. And, um, and right now, yes, also finishing the, the Miami book. So it's, I'm a lot in the studio these days, but I'm not really sure what I'm shooting next. So we'll see. <laughs> Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Only because just one last question came in. We'll do this last one and then we'll, we'll close out. Um, Leanne Milton asked, uh, what was your motivation to telling such an intimate story in Eclipse? Um, well, it f at first was really just like a mode of processing, you know, photographing. And then, you know, I do see um, a lack of, now there's so many more, but there, how, there has historically been a lack of stories about matriescence, about becoming a mother, um, especially for working women. You know, um, I'm also really passionate about uh, birthing rights for women and uh, access to good health care and um, also access to um, uh, your preferred choice of health care, i.e., you know, birthing and birthing centers and non medicated births. And, sharing my story to create awareness around all of those different topics. Amazing. Thank you. And we certainly appreciate that work. Um, thank you so much for sharing everything you shared tonight, Rose, and for your work and practice. It was such an honor and pleasure to have you here. Um, we really appreciate it. And virtual applause from everybody who's out there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. So everybody at, at, at PAM, I really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who's watching. Um, yeah, I look forward to continue, continuing to talk to you all. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.